Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. It's Dan and Matt again, back with you. Matt, thanks for uh, working with Kevin last week while I was out of the country and away from anywhere that there's even a semblance of NHL hockey. Yep. Anytime you go to the States, you're pretty much relegated to watching basketball highlights at this time of year. You know, I mean, there's a a lot of states that have hockey, but like I was in Louisiana. There's no hockey there. Nobody there probably even knows, you know, has seen the sport played professionally. No. No. And like it, right now, you pretty much would have the. Um, it was it, the Saints and the Pelicans that everybody was yeah. talking about. And yeah, <laughs> not a lot of interest in hockey there. So yeah, I can understand why it got me to go on with Kevin. And it was good to do something different. Well, thanks, Kevin, for filling in. And uh, let's talk about our interest in the Flames this past week. They played three games. And uh, let's dive right into these. So on November 14th, the Calgary Flames were in Montreal playing against the Canadians. Flames got a big 2-1 win in this game. Uh, regulation win. So often when you see those, they might be an overtime or a shootout. We'll get to that later in the week. But what would you think of this one, Matt? I thought that Jacob Markstrom stole two points uh, for the Flames in this one. I think that the team as a whole played well enough to get the win. But when the Flames needed a big save, Markstrom was there. He was, yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of times that's all you can ask for from your goalie, right, is that when you need him, he's there. Yeah, and the Flames were able to get the two points. Connor Zari finishing off a really nice passing play uh, for the game winner, uh, the first of his NHL career. And him and his line mates, uh, Martin Pospisil and uh, Nazim Kadri, have really seemed to found a niche together where they're all just working extremely well together. Yeah. And, you know, we'll talk more about that line a little bit later, but that cadre line is, has really been, I would say the driver this week. I agree. Um, and you know, it, great to see it here again. I mean, the flames got two goals. The first one was cadre from Zari. Second one was Zari from Anderson and Pospisil. So, you know, that, that line really in on all the offense here. Yeah. Um, what, one thing I had in my notes on this one, Sean Monaghan, like, you know, the guy that we paid somebody to take from us and everybody thought was broken at the time when uh, when he was taken by Montreal, looking like he's still got some gas left in the tank. Yeah, and good for Sean for finally getting over the hip injuries. And it, how would you say the Flames were in a situation where it, Basically, if they did not trade Monaghan when they did and get Nazim Kadri, like you pretty much were in rebuild mode from that point. Um, it, it, they needed a center uh, to go along with Lindholm and Backland, and Kadri was a market improvement on what uh, an injured Sean Monaghan would have been last year. Um and now he's doing a lot better. And frankly, with his injury concerns, I would still take Kadri over Monaghan even at this point. But, you know, at least the trade seems a little bit more even at this point. For sure. And um, good jumping- for him. You know, I, like I've been cheering for him to get back on the horse again in Montreal. And I'm grateful that he's taken the opportunity and running with it. Yeah, I mean, you know, you don't, you never want a guy, you know, especially one of his age. I mean, he's still a young player. Um, you never want to see a guy like that struggle in their career or end their career early. And, you know, if Monahan, he's twenty nine. If he was playing for a team in our division, I might feel differently. But I'm, I'm glad that he's coming around. I'm glad that he's having a bit of a resurgence in Montreal, and you know, hopefully, he can get another couple of years out of his career. Yeah, and like I frankly I thought like this was going to be his last contract and you know and then he would just fade off into irrelevancy but now he's looking like he might resume his career again after uh, basically uh 3 years of being a, a largely irrelevant player. Um due to I his- think this will still probably be his biggest money contract. I agree, but it's one of those where, like, could you see him, you know, becoming a 25, 30 goal scorer again? Yes. Yeah, uh, on the on the right lineup, yeah. 
Well, let's move to the next game. The Flames came home for a couple, and uh, they were here on Thursday night, the 16th, as they took on the Vancouver Canucks in Calgary. The Canucks scored early in this one with Pedersen uh, opening the scoring. Uyghur tied it up, and the Flames ended up getting a 5-2 win. I do have to compliment Vancouver on that power play goal. That was just absolutely a disgusting goal by them, and... Like, Markstrom didn't even move. Like, it was already in the net by the time he read the pass. And, like, it, that I, was I think both both of Vancouver's goals were were goals that, you know, they worked hard for. And I don't, I don't fault the goalie for either one. No. And, uh, you know, you, you can see why Vancouver has three of the top scorers in the NHL. They're a dangerous team, and they are clicking on all cylinders. Um in this game, though, I was very glad to see the Flames fans in the Saddle Dome cheering on Jonathan Huberto. I think that was actually one of the best stories that I've seen uh, for the Flames in a long time because he's been struggling so mightily throughout the beginning of the season and last year, and for the team to just rally behind him and then for him to actually be able to get the monkey off his back, like you could see the joy in the rest of his teammates when he scored that goal. Yeah, the joy. I mean, I was in the building for that one, and not only the joy for from his teammates, but from the entire sea of red. Yeah, like everybody was excited that he scored and he got that monkey off his back. And you know, as much as we've been critical and fans have been critical of him, I think it just shows that you know what. When, I, I think when he's doing, when he's performing the way that everyone expects him to, there's still a lot of love for Huberto. Oh yeah, and. Like, there's never been anything personal against Huberto. Like, he's a, a very good person. Uh, you know, it's just, you know, when you're signing an $84 million contract and then you put up 57 points, everybody naturally is going, um, what? <laughs> but, you know, the talent didn't vanish with him. Like, he is still as good as he ever was. It's just... A, a lot to do with just confidence and, you know, uh, being able to actually thread those passes through and having players that actually work well with him and getting shifted to the Backland Coleman line, I think was exactly what the doctor ordered for him. I agree. And let's come back to lines a little bit later. Um, some of my thoughts on this game, I thought the Flames started really poorly. The first, I agree. I'd say the whole first period, they yeah. didn't have good puck possession. They were looking sloppy. And I think if they would have continued to play that way for the entire 60 minutes, this would have been almost the opposite score. Yeah. They, they came out in the second, they pushed hard. They cleaned up their game a little bit. You could tell that they really wanted the win. And, you know, so often when the flames are in that kind of a mode, they just stay in it. So I, I really have to give them credit for, changing their mindset, coming out and doing something different, getting excited. It seemed like they wanted to be there. And, you know, I think it shows us that when the flames want to do this, when the flames play the way that we know they can, yeah, good things are going to happen. Well, and uh, ever since Zari and Pospisil came up, like this team is starting to have some big similarities to the 2014, 15 find away flames where, like, they're getting a bit of a resiliency and a youthful energy of, like, oh, well, we're down one or two or three. Well, we'll get that back. And, like, we saw in the following game where the Flames did go down by a pair of goals, they were able to find their way back into an overtime game. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, this one, I maybe the best way to say this one was... Um, the flames worked hard for it. You know, mm -hmm. they worked hard, but they got rewarded for their work. I agree. And that's, that's a very well deserved I, two points. It was. Yeah. It, it was hard fought. They worked hard. I would say they outworked their opponent and you know, they, they were always in front of the net. They were doing everything they had to do. And that's really all you can ask for. And then the last game of the week against the Seattle, uh, or sorry, Seattle's coming up against the New York Islanders. Um, the Flames, d the Flames uh, would not continue to put the Islanders on their on their um, losing streak. What was it? Seven games. Yeah. Um, and the Islanders beat the Flames five four. I would say in this one, the first half of the first period again didn't look great for the Flames. They just 
they came out very similar to that Vancouver game. I thought they had good structure in the second, but there was a few stretches where they were just too casual. And that's when the Islanders were able to come in, put some pressure on the goalie, get some goals. But I thought that in the last seven minutes of the third, the Flames were really able to pick things up, get going again, get what they need to do, and, you know, show again that they can do it when they want to and, you know, get that tying goal. Um, Yeah, and I thought it was interesting, like, when they actually did tie it up at three and then surrendered the goal right away. Like, last year's addition of this team, like, they would have folded at that point, and, like, they probably would have got one or two shots yeah. the rest of the way. Even the three weeks ago edition of this team. Yeah. And this year, like, now, this team's like, okay, well, we spotted you one, we'll get that back, and, like, they just were relentless after the 4-3 goal for the Islanders, and they just fought and fought and fought and fought until Sharon Govich's tip. Uh, tied the game and then they kept pushing the rest of the game until it hit the shootout yeah for sure it was uh it was definitely a you know a lot of work for the team to stay where they were and i feel like coming back you know when they're down 3-1 they worked hard i think it's fair to say in this one that the flames worked for the one point they didn't necessarily lose the two points, if that makes sense. Yeah, at any time that you're down by multiple goals halfway through the game and you can salvage a point out of it, I almost consider that a win in and of itself because you're not likely going to get a point. And, you know, it's disappointing that they they continue to struggle in the shootouts. And, like, while they have one really dynamite player in Sharon Govich in the shootouts, they need to find somebody else that can score as well because like he's two for three on his attempts and that literally everybody else is zero for nine this season. And it's like, you need somebody to find a way to get a, get a puck in the net. The shooters for Calgary in this one, Sharon Govich, who scored Huberto Anderson and Zari all did not score any, any issues you have with those selections for the shootout? No. Um, Huberto generally is a decent scorer, Anderson, same thing. Zari, same thing. It just, you know, Sorokin's a good goalie. And, you know, Huberdeau had the puck bounce on him when he was trying to make a deke. And the other two shots, Sorokin made good saves. You know, it's one of those where there's not much you can do. And, you know, you just hope for better. And, you know, I I wish that the NHL would uh, scrap uh, the shootout entirely and have ever since they instituted it and uh, just you extend, and me you know, overtime to, you know, 10 minutes or something. It's just, yeah. Cause like the, you know, like to me, like that, this was one of those games that felt ruined by a shootout. Um, because like it was such a good back and forth game throughout the contest. Yeah. And you know, I, I mean, we don't have to get into all of our thoughts on the shootout now, but I don't see why you can't tie in the regular season. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think sometimes I know that when they put the shootout in, they said they were doing it to help build rivalries. I think that you can build a rivalry just fine with ties. I mean, you know, you go back and look at, you know, combat sports and stuff, pro wrestling. You know, there's been a lot of storylines advanced by guys tying until the blow-off match. Yeah, I agree. So... You know, I, and a lot of other sports allow ties in the in the regular season, but that's another story for another day. I agree. So with that, now the Calgary Flames have played 17 games. There's six wins, eight losses, and three overtime losses for a total of 15 points. That puts them still ahead of Edmonton. We're still less bad than Edmonton, uh, who has 11. Seattle right above us at 18, and tied with the Ducks also at 18 for the f- fifth and fourth places in the Pacific. So. Um, the Flames, I don't know about you, Matt, they felt like they were turning a corner this week. That's how I looked at it. Yeah, ever since the month clicked over to November, like they're 4-1-2 and two now in the month of November. I, you know, it's one of those where, as like we said at the beginning of the season, that um, like anytime there's a new coach and a new system, it takes a while for the team to get used to it. And... You know, I, I think everybody rightfully panicked when the Flames were, I think it was 2-7-1 and one at one point. And, you know, because, like, we were expecting you to struggle, not be, like, worst in the league bad. But, 
you know, they they have been able to rebound um, quite successfully, and if they can keep this up, like, they could find themselves in a playoff spot soon, if, you know, it, even if at the end of the month, if they keep this up, and, like, they're, they are only three points out of a playoff spot at this point, which is a minor miracle considering their start. Yeah, I mean, I think there's still a lot of work to do there. I'm not at the point where I'm willing to say, oh, yeah, the Calgary Flames have turned things around and, you know, all my all my issues have been solved. I'm I'm nowhere near that point right now. No. But I think that it's, you know, we're starting to see a change and you need small change before you can get big change. Oh, I agree. And it's like they've, they've taken a plan a bunch of plenty good steps in the right direction all the all through the lineup like now you're you're starting to see three lines being extremely effective um with the cadre line uh, the backland line and the uh greer plus whomever line all being extremely effective now getting that first line going has been a struggle but with the light most recent shakeup, things are st- seeming to be a little better um but you know like if we can get everybody on the same page then this team could go on a bit of a run to get back into a playoff spot and realistically like if even if they get to like back into eighth or whatnot you know it's like okay that's great that you fought all the way back now you've basically zeroed the clock let's go now you have to start from here and you know, like this team is going to fall back at some point into some sort of struggle because every team does at some point in the season. And it's just uh, trying to see when and how uh, this team will do that. And like if they can mitigate it being a long stretch of mediocrity, you know, and more of the successful hockey, but we'll see. You were mentioning some of the the line changes, so let's talk about the lines as they were in the last game, the game against the Islanders. Right now, as it sits, the Calgary Flames' first line, we'll call it, is Dylan Dubé, Elias Lindholm, Andrew Mangiapane. Second line is Connor Zari, Nazem Kadri, and Martin Pospisil. The third line is Jonathan Huberto, Michael Backlund, and Blake Coleman. And the fourth line is A.J. Greer, Adam Rajichka, Igor Sharangovich. You and I, and I think all of the Sea of Red, have had some issues around Kadri and Huberto. I think right now we've found the right pairing, you know, the right two guys for uh, Kadri. And as you mentioned, Huberto's getting going. How long do you think this will be the the lineup for the Flames? I think that this, as long as they're going well, I think you just run with them indefinitely. And, um, like, it... How would you say the problem that uh, and the main concern I have uh, with the Kadri line is the youthful enthusiasm of both the Zari and Pospisil. Um, quite frequently, young players will play good for the first like 15, 20 games that they're up and then start to slowly drift backwards. Um, it'll be interesting to see if those two guys can keep up the, their level of play um, beyond the 15, 20 game mark. And if so, then what does that look like for this team moving forward? And if they do backslide, you know, are guys like Coronado or Peltier available to possibly swap spots with those guys? Yeah. And, and, you know, I guess depending on how much they slide, they could still be on the NHL roster. I mean, I I don't think that any of us expected Marty Pospisil when he got called up to be a second line player. No, and he's absolutely looked fantastic. Like the you know, like if he plays like this, like he's a a top six forward for the rest of his career. What like it? It's you almost have to take like a double and triple take. Like, is this Martin Pospisil doing this? Like, what? Yeah. <laughs> and like and like you said, I think we also have to temper our expectations because these guys have still played, you know, less than 10 games in the National Hockey League at this point. We, you know, it could just be that, you know, sort of, I hate to say beginner's luck, but like you said, a lot of rookies are excited. They well, look, look really at good. Adam Ruzitska last year. Like he started off really strong and then as the season went on, he faded. And, and at this point, I'm almost at the point right now where I'd take him out of the lineup and put Doer back in. Yeah. 
Exactly, and it it's one of those where like this team has, ha, you know, and this is where it's a good opportunity because of the situation that they're in to be able to actually give guys like Zarya and Pospisil all the runway that they can and just say, okay, kids, run with it. And if they succeed, well, hey, awesome. If they don't, well, at least you also have that information about those two guys. Yeah, and, and you know, even if they slide a little bit, I think that there's still a spot on the NHL roster for them, um, you know, even if they're not on the second line. But right now... I mean, I'm wondering how much you can actually break that line up. Like, it almost feels like it's. Remember the 3M line? From yeah, a couple I years agree. Ago with with Froelich and uh, Backland and Kachuk, and it was almost better than the sum of its parts. Like, I think even if it's not that line's not getting first or second line minutes right now, I'm not sure I'd break it up because, like, well, you know, frankly, I think that Caudry, line is better than the sum of its parts. Yeah, like Cadre is looking as good as he did with the Avalanche in his 90 point season like he's looking like a dominant top line center and it's like okay <laughs> you know it, you know if it takes those two guys playing with you for you to play like that keep them together like you know yeah. if anything like if the flames do later on in the season decide that they need to tear down uh, then you know if you have Kadri popping off like a first line center and he does not want to be a part of the rebuild then you know you can easily move that contract out in that kind of a situation so yeah i don't know how easy it is but i think well, it becomes really, easier yeah well 5 years at 7 million dollars for a player that's playing like that i think that there would be 31 teams looking at that as a realistic. but if i'm a gm i'm also looking at is he going to play that well for me or do i need to acquire his two line mates as well yeah, and it, it's one of those where, you know, I, I think that would narrow the list some, but not entirely, because a lot of other teams have guys like Zari and uh, Pospisil on their team. So, you know, it would just be up to them to find the right chemistry and fit. But that's another story for another time. <laughs> and then, you know, we, we've been looking for the right fit for Jonathan Huberto all year. I think we can all agree it wasn't working when he was paired with Elias Lindholm. The Flames have now put him on what is extensively the third line right now with Backlund and Coleman. It's working there. Well, but the, the one thing that I like about the, that matchup is that you have two extremely smart players in Michael Backlund and Blake Coleman. And, like, if their talent level uh, was equivalent to uh, how well they think the game, like, they both of these guys would be superstars because they, they both know where they need to be on the ice to both make and receive passes. And that's been one of the problems that Huberdeau's had with his other line mates through his entire tenure with the flames is that like, he's just not on the same page with them, but like now his line mates know exactly where they need to be to utilize Huberdeau effectively. And it's seeming to click rather well. Yeah, no, I, I think you're you're definitely right about that. It's clicking well, but I guess the question is, do you leave him there? Like, yeah, once I do. he gets once he gets going, you would leave him with those guys. Yep. If it if it's not broken, you know, like how would you say Backlund and Coleman are easily able to get fifty points in a year, um, just because, like it, it it seems like they're in the forty to fifty point range, regardless of who the third person on their line is. So if you've got Huberto firing pucks through all the maze of bodies and it hitting the other guys and they're actually generating a ton of offense, you know, you can't really complain about that. And it it seems that, you know, for whatever reason, like uh, Lindholm and him just do not see the game the right way together and they're not on the same page. Um, I did find that uh, Huberdeau was clicking fairly well with Manjapane at times uh, this season, but it, it just the unit itself was not being cohesive. And, you know, at this point, I think it makes more sense to do whatever it takes to get Huberdeau being as effective as he can um, more than necessarily which line he needs to play on. Yeah, no, I, I think you're right with that. I guess 
I would probably leave him there as well, and I think we'll probably end up seeing that the Kadri line and the Huberto Backlund Coleman line probably become your top two lines. I think that the Lindholm Monjapani Dubay line probably at some point gets reduced to line three with the way those lines are all playing right now. Yeah, and one thing I would like to see is Dubay and Sharon Govich being switched permanently. Um, and so you're having thinking you put Dubay with Greer and whoever else. Yeah, and Sharon and then Govich. Govich with Lindholm and Mangiapane. Yeah. Um, and I, how I tend to look at like those three lines specifically is kind of like having three high quality second lines where they're all interchangeable and you can kind of like as the coaching staff, if line A is not doing well, you can give them the slightly less like third line minutes. And if another line's really popping off, you give them the first line minutes and everybody's just kind of, you know, equal then you just roll the lines until something changes and you know i i think have the flames will need to be a little bit more by committee this year um just because they don't have that like true sniper guy who can just pop like 40 by himself for sure yeah and i and i think the way the lines are set up now and you know if they make the change that you're talking about i think that you can. You can then, every night, based on who's doing well, give them... And, you know, people have said the Flames don't have a first line. To me, the first line is the line that plays the most minutes. Second line is the second most. Um, I think you can, you know, tweak those minutes every night. And I think you've got two or three lines that, you know, you can use as your first line on any given night. Yeah, and it, it's one of those where it also becomes very useful for this team. Like, it, just in terms of depth and quality... Um, in terms of being able to generate momentum because if you happen to get a couple of those lines on a roll and like the fourth line is general because of Greer mostly is been that was a good pickup yeah like he, that line has been extremely effective regardless of who's cycling with Greer on that line um but you know like you can start rolling lines and like we saw in the Vancouver game where once everybody started going, then like it kind of like everybody fed off of each other and they were able to walk over Vancouver rather effectively as the game went on. And it'll be interesting to see if they can get that right mix for everybody. Yeah, for sure. It'll it'll take some time, but I think that we're still experimenting with the lines a little bit. I think we have two lines sorted out. Um, I'm not sure that the... Lindholm line stays the way it is. Like you said, I think that Sharon Govich will get a shot there, but I think that we're, we've got two of the four lines sort of locked in and figured out at this point. Matt, you got to think at this point that if you're Lindholm, I mean, you know, people were saying that um, he was, he was, uh, you know, looking for 9 million in, in the off season. You got to think if you're him, you probably should have taken the burden hand of whatever they offered in the off season. Cause right now there's no way you're getting that. Yeah, like, frankly, with how he's looking, it's looking more like that uh, contract will start with a 7 um, than a 9. Uh, yeah, it's not looking very good. Uh, and no, it's not. Like, how would you say, I can understand where Lindholm was coming from with wanting to maximize the dollars, uh, but, uh, frankly, like, he just got greedy. Um, and... Like he, how would you say he's not Michael Backlund defensively? Um, he's very good offensively, but not exceptional. And you know, like he's just a very good player uh, in the same mold that like Kadri or Bo Horvat have been. But like that, neither one of those guys is a top tier center either. Yeah, no, I, I think I think that's a good analysis and i think that we're seeing now that lindholm maybe isn't the you know top line center that he thought he was or the flames thought he was and you know like would i be open to him signing a long-term extension oh sure it's just you know because like finding top six centers is not easy it, it's just you know like the dollar amount is gonna have to get a little bit more realistic and like, I can understand him pushing for the moon, but, you know, like, uh, the the nine-plus contract is not, uh, like, I, there's not a team in the NHL that's going to sign him to that. 
No, I agree. And, and you know, it might be that he almost needs that rude awakening of going to free agency, realizing, crap, I'm not getting what I want. Well, we then, saw that with uh, Klingberg uh, with, when he, you know, Dallas had offered him a long term extension at like, I think, six and a half, seven million dollars. And he turned that down because he thought he was better than that. And he got a one-year deal and then played poorly and now is basically, you know, like one year away from being out of the NHL entirely. And, you know, Lindholm, you know, like, I don't think he'll have that drastic of a decline, but, you know, like, he's going to be in for a rude awakening if he goes to free agency. He will for sure. Um... I guess let's move on to something that's been covered by a lot of Flames media, and that's the Nikita Zadorov trade request. It came out this week through Zadorov's agent that he won out of Calgary. Um, Elliot Friedman said the Zadorov thing hit the hit the team really hard last week. Uh, he heard that it upset some players, obviously. Zadorov was frustrated, and that's why the agent sent out the tweets. But at the same time, Zadorov knows who his agent is. Like that's the kind of thing that this guy's known to do. Um but, you know, Zadorov has been, I would say, one of the guys on this team this year who I think has shown the most emotion. He's shown frustration. It's okay to be frustrated. Um, you know, and I I wouldn't be surprised to hear that he wants out. Are you? No. Well, you realistically have to look at this team. And for, like, the last decade plus, like, this team has had a little bit of a problem with players underperforming their on-paper talent level. And their give a crap meter has been near zero for most of it. And, you know, just on the outward appearance. And, you know, it, it's one of those, like, he called out the team earlier this season. Uh, and then nobody responded. And, you know, like, if I, it was me in that situation where, you're, like, you're trying to light a fire under everybody. And, you know, it's like... It was, uh, past the just splatting off the wall and trickling down to the floor, well, of course, you're going to be like, well, I'd rather go somewhere where the players actually care. And, you know, like, because, you know, Zadorov's a very smart person. Like, he's not, you know, he understands that, like, his NHL career is finite as well. And even though he's 27, you know, like, there's only so many contracts that he can sign and so many opportunities that he can to win a Stanley Cup. And, like, uh, you know, a lot of fans were confused when, you know, like, at one point saying that, oh, he'd like to stay here forever and then requesting a trade. And I think that's more on the rest of the team than him, where, you know, like, if the team was actually showing up at that point, then, like, I don't think... Like, I, you know, I, I would expect Zadorov would be the guy that you'd want to keep the most out of. The and we UFAs. talked about that when we did our rebuild episode, too. Yeah. It, and, you know, if the Flames start winning and, like, playing more together as a team, would I expect, like, that trade request to be rescinded? Yeah. Um, You know, and just much like the Michael Backlund trade request where... You know, he basically said, I'm out of here, you know, until he got a buy-in from the team and, you know, like, okay, we're actually going for this. And then he re-signed, like, you know, things have went off the rails in the first month and leading to Zadorov getting asking for the trade. But, you know, like, if the Flames can correct themselves on, you know, in the standings page, then... You know, like, I, I could see the Flames revisiting the Hannafin extension, the Zordorov extension, uh, Lindholm extension, and, and, like, there actually being movement towards a conclusion if, you know, like, the team's actually playing together as a team. But, you know, you can't have a, any success in an organization if everybody's playing like a bunch of individuals. And... You know. I've seen a lot of fans online saying, you know, how come he's not moved yet? And... We don't want to move this guy just to move him. No. Craig Conroy needs to find the right deal. And if that takes a week, two weeks, three weeks to do, I I have faith that Connie's going to find the right deal. He's not just going to move Zadora for the sake of moving him at this point. Well, but you know, hearkening back to um, the Colorado Avalanche, like Matt Duchesne asked for a trade 
and Joe Sackick sat on him for months and months and months until he got a deal that he liked, and he ended up winning that trade hands down. And, you know, it, just because a player is unhappy, it's like, well, good for you. You're you're under contract. <laughs> you know, like I, I will accept the trade if something comes up. If it doesn't, well, too bad. <laughs> you know, like you can play out your contract and leave as a free agent. Like, it, you know, it's one of those where... You know, there's not a lot you can do. Like, it, yeah, it sucks, and it's frustrating, but I think, like, everybody in the organization's been a little frustrated and pissed off with how the start of the season was, and, you know, things seem to be getting a little better, and we'll see if that's a more permanent thing or just a blip on the radar as well. Yeah, and, you know, even closer to home, I would say Sam Bennett. I mean, when he asked for a trade i'm trying to pull up the exact dates here but you know he asked for a trade and it wasn't until a few weeks later that they actually found a you know a suitor for him yeah and like honestly if it was not for the expansion draft that year honestly i think sam bennett's still a flame <laughs> it's just they need they were going to lose him for nothing in the expansion draft so you know might as well get something for him instead of nothing at this point, though, if the Flames are moving Zadorov, I think you have to be bringing back an NHL defenseman. I mean, they're already one guy short running D. Simone there. You can't move him. There's really no room for another forward at this point. You probably don't want to pick. Like, am, am I out of line thinking that they've got to bring back a defenseman? Uh, yes and no. Um, it, it really depends on the timing of the trade. Like, if it's sooner than later, then yes. If it's later than sooner, then I think you just go with whatever the best assets are. Um, like, if, you know, like we're talking like the end of January type of thing, then realistically, like, if the Flames are making that trade, then likely the Flames are out of it by then. Yeah, if it's deadline season, but I can't see this lingering until January. Oh, I can. I'd actually be somewhat shocked if this was concluded by the end of the year. Like the calendar year. See, and I was pretty sure it would be concluded by by the end of the calendar year. Yeah, it it very well could be, but um, how would you say because the Flames are, are rebounding, uh, you know, and like everybody seems to now be pulling in the the same direction together, you kind of have to let that ride for a bit just to like you know I would not want to undercut the progress that the team seems to be making as a team and you know like if they're actually pulling their head out of it from where they were you know you don't want to say oh well good for all your hard work and we're trading everybody off now so it's kind of one of those hard to gauge until like we're just a little further along than we are right now well, and I mean, you know, you're talking about trading everybody off. There's also talk that um, Tanev and Hannafin are on the block. Like, I think if you're going to move three of your six defensemen any time before the deadline, you can only do that if you think you're out. Oh, yeah. And realistically... Half your defensive core. Yeah, like, realistically, if the Flames are, you know, not in a playoff spot by January, like, frankly... The, you know, we're just counting down the days until you hear on the news that so-and-so has been traded for this, that, or whatever. And, you know, realistically, defensemen always uh, tend to get an over amount of assets in return at the trade deadline. Like uh, Ben Sherratt got a first and a good prospect. And, you know, like that's basically a Chris Tanev comparable if there ever was one. Uh, so, you know, like the flames, it can load up just by moving those three players. And I would expect a young defenseman or two to be involved in those trades, even if it is like guys that are like Soloviev, where they're just kind of quasi on ready for the NHL. And then the flames would just play said prospect, you know, like here's a welcome to the NHL. Have a couple months, have fun. I think at this point you can afford to move any one of those guys between now and let's call it mid-January trade deadline season, but I don't think you can really afford to move more than one of them before then. No, and I think that would depend on like what the return would be. 
like if you're getting blown away um with the return like you know and this is going to sound weird the huberto for kachuk trade like the rumored returns that uh, st louis and carolina were offering were nothing in comparison to what florida offered and so it's like a clear yeah we're just going to make that deal didn't turn out as well as we, we thought but you know it's still early but you know like compared to what the other returns were like that was easily the best option for and, sure and i mean you like to you like to go down this path and we talk trade of course if you get a great yeah. option you take it but you know assuming you know assuming that doesn't happen i would imagine yeah. that you're probably getting very similar offers on those guys but you know i don't think you can move you know even yeah. two of your three well and that's where like what i'm trying to get at is like in order to move any of those three guys or multiple of those three guys before like the end of January, realistically, you're going to have to be blown away by a deal in the same mold of the Deshane trade or, you know, the Kachuk Huberdo trade where you're getting a lot back in return. And, you know, like, unless you're getting that where, you know, you'd be like, I'm stupid if I don't do this, you know, then you know you're just not going to because then you'll wait until the trade deadline like if all the de offers are basically the same and then you just you know pick your poison at that point yeah and you know i mean if i've always said if a guy doesn't want to be here get him out and yes things can change like you were mentioning with zadorov but if you you know if i'm conroy I'd, i'm actively working the phones i'm actively trying to figure out you know, who will give me what? And I would probably circle back with Zadorov at the end of this month and say, Hey, how you feeling? Do you still want out? And I think if he wants out, you move him for the best thing you can get now, even if it might not be the best package. Cause I, I, I think if a guy doesn't want to be here, you got to respect that and get rid of him. Yeah. And then, you know, the other guys, I think you can take more time to really consider what the best package is and what your needs are around the deadline, whether that's a retool, whether that's, yeah. you know, a playoff run, whatever that is. Yeah. It, me specifically, you know, like if I was in Conroy's shoes, I'd also be reaching out to Zadorov to ask what his numbers would be for an extension just to see on that front as well. Because, you know, honestly, I, I think that Zadorov is a bit of a odd player in that, um, He's a lot more cerebral than a, a lot of other guys seem to be. And, you know, like if you can kind of, you know, if it makes sense to kind of sell him on, you know, being a leadership person in much the same way that you did with Backland, that, you know, you could, you know, bridge the gap on that and you know, basically be blunt with him if you really do want to keep him, um, where, you know, like, we'll give you an A and, you know, you're going to be one of the leaders on this team as we transition and shake things up and we'll, you know, build more around your concept of what this team should be. You know, like, that's also another potential wrinkle to this. Like, it's very hard. I don't know if I'd go that far with him. I mean... He's not the kind of guy that I'm going out trying to do whatever it takes to get him to stay. Yeah, he's got a unique skill set. Yeah, he's a great player here, but I still think he's, you know, a bottom three defense for most teams in this league. And I think, you know, it's either, hey, you want to be here or you don't. And yeah, if he it, wants out, I can't see asking him for a number. Like, he's trying to get away from this. Well, it's one of those things where, like... It, it's going to sound a little weird, but I actually kind of agree with him and his agent where I think like he's not getting enough of an opportunity here. Um, and like, I think there is more there, there with Zadorov, um, it, that, you know, just due to numbers, like we haven't really been able to explore with him. Uh, cause usually like he's partnered with the weakest defenseman on the third pairing. Uh, but, like, at times when he hasn't been, you know, like, when he's been with Tanev or whatever, like, his game has, like, he's actually a ra rather effective player. And, like, this whole situation with the Flames this year is a little bit, like, we're in bizarro land, <laughs> frankly. 
Like it, I think what's more likely to happen, Matt, is that he goes somewhere else. Yeah. He realizes that maybe the grass isn't greener and he comes back in the off season more than I think if you're trying to ask him his number, you're getting an inflated number now. And I don't want to, you know, overpay him to stay at this point. Yeah. Where I'm different, where, uh, you know, myself, like I, if it took a, like a five year, six million per deal, I would sign that. So. Yeah, and, I, and I'm not at the point where I would if I was the GM. Yeah. So we'll agree to d- differ on that one, but I wouldn't be That's surprised if if we see that deal done sooner rather than later, which, you know, I mean, Oliver Shillington's really put a, a cramp in the Flames blue line this year. Well, a- as he did last year, and, you know, it, it sucks that whatever is holding him back is holding him back, but... You know, the Flames are getting, you know, like, this is also going to sound weird. Nick D. Simone has played exceptionally good for this team. And I'm actually surprised at how well he has played in his 10 or so games with the Flames. And, you know, like, he's looking like a really dynamite number six right at this point. Well, I think that's the key. He's looking like a dynamite number six, right? This is not a guy who should be in your top four. Oh, no. Oh, for sure, no. But... Um, you know, and Ilya Soloviev, he looked really good, um, in his games here and in the preseason, like the flames do have internal options. And like when Poirier gets back, like he looked really good in the preseason and in the first few games with the Wranglers and, you know, like this team does have options. It's just, yeah, everything is, do we have any, do we have any new news on Poirier? I haven't heard anything. Uh, from what I gather, it's going to be months. Like, generally, That's that type of too. injury, like, it, it probably, like, February, March will be his return, just based on other people who have suffered similar And injuries. even at that point, I'd probably send him down to the American League. Oh, yeah, he will be. And, you know, it, he might get a call-up, like, late in the season, like, post-trade deadline, if he's doing well, like, post-return. But I think that, like, he just needs to play once he gets back. With everything going on with Calgary this week, um, Elliot Friedman reported that um, Michael Backlund has spoke to the other players. He he wasn't sure if it was group or one-on-one, but he, he said that Backlund has mentioned that they have to end the noise. There's too many distractions around the team. Um, especially after Zadorov last Friday, and apparently Backlund said enough of that, where you need to concentrate on playing. If you don't want to be here, let the general manager know, and we'll figure it out. As long as you're here, no more noise. We have to play. And that's one of the reasons that Elliot believes the Flames have had a really good week. And, you know, I, I think that's I think that's probably a good way of saying it, is there's so many distractions, we just need to cut that down and focus on the on ice. We can't, you know, if you're a Huberto, you can't talk, you can't worry too much about the media and what they're saying to you. You can't worry about everything going on around. It's almost just shut up and play at this point. Yeah. And you know, like we're starting to see this team turn around and like, I think everybody after the whole Kachuk and Goudreau thing, you know, like everybody was just so pissed off and upset by how that shook out. And then, after that then Sutter goes off on you know being a jerk to everybody to the point where you know he had to get fired you know which was you know (laughs) a lot you know to get him to get fired and then you know to start the year two seven and one like it you know like I can understand why like the whole team is frustrated and upset and like okay well if we're gonna be terrible let's you know find places on other teams and you know like i think that you know finally having the ability to practice on a regular basis instead of being out on the east coast and you know getting some more rhythm in their game that they're starting to turn things around um and we'll see and uh, you know like this team has the talent still like they've always had where they could be a dangerous playoff team but you know it it's been basically the noise frankly that has gotten in the way uh for the last year and a month and hopefully with backland actually stepping up as captain and you know saying come on guys let's focus hopefully that 
actually pays dividends and this team starts moving in that right direction. You know, and that's exactly where I was going to go with it is, um, you know, Backlund stepping up as the captain, right? And he's not the guy that you often think of as the most direct in the room. The guy who's going to challenge people, that sort of thing. But I think that it's it's great to see that that's happening. He's stepping up and embracing that as the leader. And, you know, I think as an older guy as well who, um, you know, who really wants to make sure that he's getting his cup in his career. I mean, he's contri- he's here for the rest of his probably his career at this point like let's just step up and do this and i think you know he's seen so much noise so much issue with previous iterations of this team it's like you know shut up and play yeah and frankly like this team has lacked that vocal leadership um where you know like getting guys to pull in the same direction uh hearkening all the way back to the aginla era um where like you know like as as much as we like giordano uh like the team throughout his whole tenure seemed kind of disorganized and up and down from season to season month to month and like uh, frequently underperforming and not really responding in the way that teams usually do um because Frankly, sometimes you need a kick in the ass. And, like, when the Flames ha- hired Daryl, he was kicking everybody in the butt. And, like, the Flames had a really good first season with him. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, but, like, you need internal people, not just the coaching staff yelling at you. You need your captain and your alternates to. And not having anyone wearing the C the past couple of years might have been part of that issue. You know, like it's just there was nobody there being accountable in the same way as the guy wearing the C. Well, and like you see in like a team like Boston where like there are layers of leadership where if like players aren't cutting the mustard that, you know, that you have guys like Marchand and previously Bergeron and Chara, you know, calling them out and like, let's go, you know, because we have standards here let's you know we're professionals let's go and you know calgary really hasn't had anybody internal on the team holding everybody to account in the manner that backland seems to be at this point yeah it's it i guess i i wanted to bring it up because it's just really nice to hear that he's embracing that as the captain and you know doing what captains need to do even when it's hard when your team's down is you know i don't want to say fight the team but just kind of come out and say you know maybe make that challenge of we're we're better than this we can do this and taking that leadership role well and and like that's been one of the problems that calgary frankly has had over the last you know decade plus is that like they've had some really dynamite talented teams but almost like an air of immaturity in the organization, um, like hearkening back to Gaudreau, Monaghan, and Lance Bulma with the Super Bowl party incident, and you know, like things like that. And you know, it fall, if you follow the Toronto Blue Jays, like you're seeing the same thing with like uh, Bo Bichette and Vlad Guerrero, where you know, a little too lackadaisical, and you know like the teams that are always generally elite regardless of the sport like they have multiple guys who are the veteran guys that you know keep everybody in that professional m- manner like you saw like with Chicago you had guys like Duncan Keith and uh Jonathan Taze that would constantly be calling people out and other depth players too uh like Troy Brower did and uh you know like Dave Boland like they all had like that vested interest in you know making sure everybody was on the same page and you know it if calgary is ever going to get that success like they're going to need players like that stepping up in that leadership role to keep both themselves and everybody else accountable couldn't have said it better um last quick story here for the show is The Wranglers third jersey, the Calgary Wranglers have unveiled a third jersey, and I had a bit of deja vu when I saw it. They're called the Outlaw jersey. It's pretty much the Flames 04 black jersey with the Wranglers version of Blasty, which for those, if you don't know, the picture will be in the show notes on firesidechat.ca if you want to see it, but it's Blasty's head turned sideways. What are your thoughts on that, man? 
oh, I I liked it better than the original Blaster. Like, if that had been the actual Flames logo at that point, um, like, that would have been, you know, like, in my opinion, one of the best third jersey logos in the NHL. But, uh, you know, it being for the Wranglers, like, they, they hit all the marks on this one. You know me, I'm not a huge Blasty fan. I never have Neither been. have I. Uh, and, you know, I think... The thing, one of the things I don't like is it's black in the sea of red. Like, I think if they want to do Blasty again, they should try him on a red jersey. Mm -hmm. You know, you could even do something like the 04 home jersey, which had the black C on it, and throw Blasty on there. But, like, I think I would feel different about Blasty if it was on a red jersey. Because, you know, we're the sea of red in, as the Flames say, quote-unquote, in dark mode. But it, it just, like, you're, you're kind of splitting your focus at that point. I agree. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see exactly what the Flames do with their branding moving forward. But, uh, yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. I, I'm, I am a little, I mean, I like this third jersey, but I am, I guess, a little disappointed. It just feels like a rehash. I mean, you know, the Flames did their reverse retro last year. I feel like if you were going to do this, the Flames should have brought this jersey out as the Blasty for this year, the third jersey, because it is a Flames template, and then use the reverse retro template for the AHL team. Like, I guess it just feels like, oh, we had a bunch of blanks in the back. Let's just use them for the AHL team. Or, I mean, the AHL team has completely different striping. Come up with something, you know, a different striping pattern for the American League team. Yeah. I, it's cool, and I like it, but it just it feels... I guess too much to me, like a rehash from, from flames history. Oh, I agree. And you know, it, it's one of those that it's hard to find that like threading the needle of both new and, you know, familiar at the same time. Yeah. And, and you know, you, I've, I've expressed my thoughts in the past. I won't do it again, but I think that this whole retro thing is, I think needs to come to an end in the NHL. I agree. Uh, and, you know, like, frankly, like, the logo, though, I think is, uh, like, a neat update to, like, it's not... Oh, I, I think it's a cool way to tie the two clubs together. Like, I can't think of any other American League team that essentially used the same NHL team's logo but flipped it sideways. Yeah. Maybe the, I guess, the AHL Penguins, sort of, kind of. Um, but, yeah, I, I think it's a really cool thing to tie the two together. So if you want to see that picture, you can, I mean, you know, look for it on your favorite flame social media. It's on our social media everywhere that we post. Um, but you can also find it at firesidechat.ca on the show notes for this page. Matt, we got something cool coming up here. Um, we have a meetup coming up in December with our fans. So we've partnered with our fan, friends at Bow River Brewing. If you guys don't know Bow River Brewing, they're a really good brewery here in town. And they're going to be opening their tap house up to us on December 14th, which is the night that the Calgary Flames are taking on the uh, Minnesota Wild. So we're going to be there at their tap house on the 14th and we'll be doing a bit of a meetup. We invite everyone listening. We, we encourage you to bring your friends, your family, any of your flames fans down there to watch the game in their tap house. Matt and I'll be there and we'd love to meet you. And they're going to be offering us some really awesome deals. They're going to offer us uh, some deals on pizza, some deals on beer. So we'd love to see everyone down there. We'll remind you again uh, in all our shows leading up to this, as well as on our social media, but if you want to share this or you want some more information, you can go to our website, firesidechat.ca, and you'll see right in the top navigation, Bow River Brewing Meetup, or you can go to firesidechat.ca slash meetup2023. Matt, this is, this is going to be a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to going out to meeting with some of our fans. And, I mean, what goes better with uh, hockey than pizza and beer? Exactly. It, it so. should be a very fun evening for everybody involved. We'll, we'll be watching the game. We invite you to come down and watch the game with us. Ask Matt and I some questions. Pick our brains on Flame stuff. It won't be a live podcast episode, but just a, a chance for us to say hi, to meet you, um, and to talk Flames hockey while we watch them play. Yep, and hopefully it'll be a good game. It it should. We uh, I, I picked that one with Bow River because I thought it'd be a good game for us to all enjoy. Yep. So Are thanks you to calling our friends. Minnesota terrible? <laughs> I'm saying it'll be a good game for the Sea of Red to watch. <laughs> um, so thanks to Bow River Bruin for hosting that. And uh, yeah, we, we hope you'll be able to be down there. 
Matt, we did our predictions uh, two weeks ago before I left. We did six games in our prediction episode. Nobody got it right. Not surprising. Um, I thought we'd beat Nashville, Ottawa, Montreal. You thought Nashville, Ottawa, Montreal, Vancouver. We were both close. We beat Nashville, Montreal, and Vancouver. It's Ottawa that threw us for the loop. Yep. Damn you, Ottawa. (laughs) um yeah you gotta wag your fist at the whatever the guy's name is on their jersey the the, yeah i don't know the senator dude yeah Um, i don't even know if he has a name (laughs) um but this week the flames have four games in the docket monday night and 8 p.m start time they're all on the road um the calgary flames are in seattle monday night then on wednesday they are in nashville to take on the predators 7 p.m start time and then a weekend back-to-back Friday and Saturday, a 6.30 p.m. start time on the 24th against the Dallas Stars, and then 8 p.m. start time against the Colorado Avalanche. So four games, seven days. What's your prediction here, Matt? I'm going to go uh, with uh, a 3-1 and one record. All right, and which three? Uh, I think they win the first two and the last one. So you think they'll beat Seattle? You think they'll beat Nashville? And you think that they will beat uh, Colorado? Yes. But you think they're going to fall to Dallas? Yeah. I think that that's probably fair. You can hear my sigh here. Like, I don't want us to fall to Dallas, but I, I think it's I think it's going to happen. Sadly. Yeah. Um, It'll, that'll flame- probably be the funnest game of the week. I think the Dallas game. Well, and I think that's the one that's really going to show us how much the Flames have turned the corner here. Like, you know, yes, they were able to beat Vancouver 5-2, and I think that was a statement game. But in the Dallas game is really going to show if the Flames can play with the big boys. Yeah, and like as much as like this team needs to get back into it um, just in general, you know, they need to also show that, you know, they can actually beat the elite teams because – you know, like if the Flames do actually manage to push and get back into a playoff spot, you also don't want to be in a situation where you're just going to be cannon fodder for whomever the top team is. Yeah, and and you know, if you want to go any further, you need to you need to be able to beat top teams. So I've been torn on this. I've been thinking about this week all week and what I want to predict here. I think that the Flames are on a bit of a roll. I mean, you know, they've got a point in their last three games, at least one point. I think they'll beat Seattle. I think that they'll probably fall to Nashville, I think probably in the in overtime or a shootout. I think they'll fall to Dallas, and I think they beat Colorado. So I'm going to say they win Seattle, Colorado, lose Dallas, Nashville. Yeah. Where do you pull Vladar this week? Uh, probably the Nashville game. Yeah, so you would give, uh, you would give marks from back-to-back – Dallas, Colorado. Yep. I think Nashville's a fair assumption there. I would even potentially go with the Seattle game. I mean, you know, I think either one of those you get marks, or, or I think either one of those you get Vladar in one of the two. Uh, Seattle. The, or the Nashville. main reason why I uh, went Seattle and or Nashville and says Seattle was mainly just due to divisional opponent um, and throwing the better goalie against the divisional rival. Because, you know, like, frankly, Nashville's terrible and is not going to make the playoffs this year. Like, they're just not equipped for it. So, you know, you can kind of, like, if you you drop that game, you're not really hurting yourself too much. Whereas Seattle, you're directly losing four points on them. Yeah, no, I I see where you're going with that. I I could see them, though, looking at it in a slightly more positive way and saying, you know what, Dan Vladar, we trust you enough to put you in the Seattle game. Yeah, uh, I just uh, think that, uh, like, if the Seattle game was second and Nashville was first, I might agree with you. It's just that uh, I think that you're going to want Markstrom for the back-to-back, and he does well in back-to-back games for whatever reason especially on the second half uh, because I remember him winning a few of them last year and the year before. Um, So, you know, and with it basically being the two best teams from the central, that makes the most sense to throw him in for both of those. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. I think um, it's one of those where, you know, like if you want to have a chance in those games, I think you need to have Markstrom in. 
Yeah, no, I think he'll definitely go in Dallas and Colorado. Um, Cause those are, I, I, you never want to say this early. They're must wins, but I think those are games that the flames need to prove to themselves. They can win. And I don't think you see Vladar in the first two, like Markstrom's going well. I think you want to keep him going. So yeah, I, I can agree with your logic there. Yeah. It's I, just I think, tough just because of like it being four games in seven days and managing time for everybody. <laughs> Cause it's yeah, a lot no, of hockey. It's, it is. And, and then they come back and I mean, they've got, you know, a game, even when they come back off the road trip, they have one day before they play Vegas again. So it's going to be a, a grueling seven days. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll see how it uh, all plays out this week. And Matt, I will talk to you next week. And as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.